For Those Who Are Politically Wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think a politician should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, please join the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network. Find the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network on Facebook. Welcome back to Politically Wise. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Hello, my listeners. This is Reverend Thomas Wise. The show is called Politically Wise. I have a special guest for you. His name is Mike Sabo. Mike, introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Mike Sabo, as uh, Reverend Wise said. I was a uh, formerly uh, legislative aide um, at the uh, Ohio State House with uh, Representative Andy Thompson. And actually, uh, about a year ago, actually, I accepted um, a uh, post at uh, Hillsdale College. I'm a, a master's candidate. I'm actually now going into my second year. And uh, that's actually where uh, Reverend Wise and I met was uh, at the State House. Now, you, you first started at the State House over in the Senate side, didn't you? I did, yeah, that's correct. I was, I, I was actually with Representative Thompson for about two and a half years. And then before that, I was uh, in the State Senate. Um, I was with the um, Legislative Service Commission Fellowship, and I was uh, there for about 13 months. Um, worked primarily with uh, Senator Jim Hughes over there. So that, that was a great opportunity and, you know, really good introduction to, uh, you know, state house politics in Columbus. So you've been out, you've, you're now into your, your second year at, at this illustrious institution. How's it going for you? It, it is going wonderful. It's, uh, you know, so much more than I even thought it was going to be. Um, I mean, the classes have been just wonderful. Um, this semester, actually, I'm taking classes on the Federalist Papers, uh, Congress, the American Congress, just kind of how that works, um, or, well, how it's supposed to work and then how it actually does end up working, which is two different things, unfortunately. Um, and then the uh, third class I'm taking is constitutional law, so we're just looking at separation of powers, federalism, and those kind of things, um, which is obviously, you know, big in the news today with the Hobby Lobby decisions, some of the other decisions that the uh, court has just come out with. So a lot of stuff definitely look at there, but, um, and, you know, the first year went very, very well. I'm really enjoying, you know, meeting new colleagues, especially this year, and just really some great people up here and, and really, really good professors. So I'm really, really enjoying it a lot. So what kind of courses did you take your first year? Yeah, well, first year, um, the fall, I took uh, American progressivism. So just looking at, um, you know, progressives in the early 20th century, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, um, and, and the, the professor who taught that um, is uh, Ronald Castrito. He's actually the dean of the grad school, and that's kind of one of his fortes. He's written a lot of books. He's actually himself been on, I think, the Glenn Beck show in the past, kind of talking about Wilson. Um, and then I'm trying to even think, actually, outside. Side of that, then I took a course on the early modern political philosopher. So I'm um, starting with Machiavelli, going through Hobbes and uh, John Locke, and then um, the other class I took. You know, I'm, I'm actually trying to remember now what the other class I took. <laughs> it's only a year ago, but you know, it's a lot. A lot happens actually. Oh, it was uh, a course actually on um, U.S. American history from about 1815 to 1860. But just kind of looking at it thematically, kind of looking at um, you know, kind of really the causes actually the Civil War really in general was what that course is about. And then in the spring, I took courses on Aristotle. Um, studied his ethics and politics and um, a course on liberalism around the 1960s with the new left and um, and then the uh, last course um, I'm trying to think what that course was too actually <laughs> um, for some reason it's just not coming to my mind right now but um I'll, I'll, I'll definitely remember that, you know, coming up. But it was, uh, you know, very, very good, you know, two semesters, though. You know, very, very good start, though. Hillsdale is a very conservative college, right? It is. that That's correct, yeah. And, and unfortunately, I mean, you know, this, this, they do things that really other colleges should do. 
Um, you know, they teach the American founding, they teach the principles of the American founding, and they, you know, teach that, well, just because those ideas were thought up, you know, in 1776, that we still have access to those same ideas and principles now. And, you know, unfortunately, that's kind of labeled, you know, conservative teaching, but, I mean, it used to be everybody used to teach that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's great what they do, and, uh, you know, they're a great resource, and obviously just looking at what's going on right now in our country, it is, you know, obviously needed. Um, and you look at just modern education today in general, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's def- they, they do a great service, that's for sure. Talk about American uh, progressivism and, and uh, early uh, political thinkers like Aristotle, and mm-hmm. uh, you talk about, you know, the, uh, the studying the early liberal- liberalism in the 60s, and so I, I go, well, you're talking about a different, looking, looking at the differing views, so. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know... Studying all that stuff, obviously, you know, it helps a lot just because it helps to kind of clarify, you know, looking back on, you know, guys like Aristotle, Plato, just to kind of clarify their thinking just because they were such clear thinkers. And then it kind of is great to study, um, you know, 20th century to know, you know, really where we are today because you have to know reality first before you can know, you know, kind of what to do now then to bring us closer to those principles again. And, you know, first bring us closer as a people, you know, back to God again, um, and have those, have those foundations. So it, it's really important, actually, you know, Lincoln said in the very beginning of the House Divided speech that in order, in order to know, and this is a paraphrase, in order to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been and where we're at right now. And so the, those things all kind of, kind of come together and, you know, provide that foundation. So what kind of things does the today's conservative need to know about Aristotle? Um, just, you know, just, just kind of about, I would say probably the biggest thing is, um, the, the virtue of prudence, which for Aristotle, uh, was an intellectual virtue. And that's the idea that, you know, that, that there are things that are, are set, there are ends, as he calls them, that, you know, that, um, human life has to be based upon and has to be um, forwarded to, and those ends are good things. But we can't change them on our own. I mean, it's not up to a majority vote. Um, it, it's things that were set in place. Um, you know, obviously Aristotle w- was not a Christian. He, you know, that, that came after him. Um, but, you know, it's those things that God, you know, w- set in place, essentially, and um, that we have to use our reason that he imparted in us to um, try to get to those things and establish those good things in reality. And, you know, it's, it's obviously easier said than done. You look at, for instance, the American founders in slavery, and you see that, well, you know, slavery was in this country, I mean, well before 1787, the Constitution, it was in this country for at least 200 years before that. And you have to see, okay, well, they knew it was an evil. I mean, all of them agreed it was a necessary evil at the time. But the, you have to look at different circumstances, and then how do you get that evil out as best you can? You know, because if they would have just gone ahead in 1787 and said, well, let's just throw slavery out right now, well, the South probably would not have joined, and they would have formed another country that would have pretty much been forever out of the control of the Union, and that would have been a problem. Um, So, you know, and this is, you know, Lincoln's take on it. I mean, they basically set the country on the standard maxim um, of equality, and they knew that, um, you know, hopefully in the future, that, um, you know, slavery would finally wither away. Um, he, you know, Lincoln said, actually, it was, they hoped it was slavery on the road to its ultimate extinction. So it's just that kind of thinking then that Aristotle, that, you know, that idea of prudence, doing the right thing. But, you know, it, it's harder than that because you have to look at the circumstances, too. Mm-hmm. And I would say that, you know, definitely the founders in slavery would, just that example, um, would just help us, you know, to, to think about those things today and to realize, you know, how complex some things are. I mean, you know, you know, you know what right and you know what's right and what is wrong. But then, given the circumstances, how you actually achieve that? Hmm. What would be the example today of that of that principle of prudence? Oh, oh, there are many. I mean, just you know, conservatives, just in general, how to deal with Obamacare? Um, do you you know roll it back all at once? When you know, hopefully in 2016, when hopefully uh, you know Republicans uh, do win the White House back. What do you do? And even just, I would say, even just looking back on how do you roll back the administrative state? Um, you know, people obviously view Medicare, uh, Social Security, a lot of those things as absolute right. So any kind of infringement on that is going to be looked at a bad thing. So 
so how how does that happen? How do we, I guess, become reconstitutionalized as a people? I mean, that, that that's the main question, and that takes, you know, obviously having the right principles, but then also knowing within that, um, given the circumstances, um, given where people are, then how do you actually put those into effect? How do we actually achieve them in reality? So I would say all that, all the things Republicans are talking about, that, that, that takes a lot of prudence, definitely. Particularly when government handouts are, are, are so addictive and so easy to, to take in, but to, right. to, it's very hard to be taken away. So. Right. Yeah, that, that's definitely right, because it, it's, actually, I, I think that the name for it is kind of a ratchet effect, and, and that just applies to even the size of government in general, but once a program's in, you know, it, it, it's almost virtually impossible to actually then take it out or to cancel it. Um, because then people view that kind of as their right. And then when anything is done to change it anyway, um, even, you know, save it from insolvency, you look at Bush when he tried to privatize some of Social Security and you saw what happened there. And he was actually trying to help, I, I would argue. Um, but, you know, you look at what the response was to that, and it was not good, to say the least. Um, so it's, you know, it's definitely one of those things that it, it, it takes a lot of thought and, um you know, a lot of reason, you know, a lot of thought to know, um, you know, kind of what to do with those circumstances and, and how to achieve those principles. What has uh, changed about you the most since you've been away? Uh, you know what, I, I would probably just say just, just knowledge. I mean, I've, I've just been able to read so many different books and it's, it's, just, it's just deepened in all these, you know, different areas. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the, the most is, the more I study, kind of, the more I feel I actually don't know. So, so kind of my awareness of the questions that actually exist out there, um, it, it, that's probably changed the most. It, it's not, you know, it's not exactly being unsure of things, but it's not knowing what you think you know, but it's actually knowing what you don't know. And, and I would say that, that that's probably the thing that's changed the most. Has your faith grown since you're being away at school this year? Yes. Yeah, there, there's no question about it. Um, it, it, and, and it's good, actually, even in the classroom, because a lot of Hillsdale um, professors are Christians as well, and, and they'll bring the Bible into a lot of discussions, which is great. Um, that's, you know, that, I would argue, should be the touchstone of all this, actually, at the end of the day. I mean, all this is great, what we're talking about, but without that book and without the lessons in it and without the, the, the saving grace that, that Jesus brings us, I mean, it, it, all this is really meaningless at the end of the day. Um, and, yeah, I, I would say it definitely helps it and deepen it and just to see all the things that are actually in that book and all the teachings. I mean, there's just you know, so much. I mean, it, it's endless, basically. So that, that that's, you know, definitely helped deepen my faith, absolutely. What was the toughest course for you? Um, I would say, actually, it's funny. I just remember now that. The, the second course, second semester, uh, it was actually the uh, course on the late modern political philosophers, which was uh, Rousseau, um, uh, Hegel, Kant, um, and then Nietzsche. Um, I would say that course was probably the toughest, uh, just because I, I had not read any of those guys before. And, you know, some of those thought, especially Kant, he, he almost had to create a whole new language to even talk about what he was talking about um, and, and his teachings and so forth. I would say that course is probably the toughest. And then the professor in that course, uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas West, he's just a brilliant guy and you know, very demanding as well and in a good way. And I think it helps. Um, you know, just writing papers for him and um, just kind of being in class. And so both, you know, the content and, and, and the teacher definitely made that, I think, the hardest course. But I probably learned the most, I think, in that course out of any mm -hmm. of them. I have barely heard of thinkers. What type of things did they come up with? Sure. Well, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to categorize, but, you know, just even with going with Rousseau, um, he, he kind of has a doctrine, almost actually kind of like evolution, where, you know, man in the original state was kind of this happy, you know, go lucky, kind of carefree, and then as civilization moved along, that's kind of what corrupted man. And then it kind of just goes on from there. Um, Hegel, actually, for instance, who a lot of the progressives were heavily indebted to, Woodrow Wilson especially, he came up with this idea called historicism that you know, thought, you know, thoughts and ideas and principles are essentially a product of their times. Um, for instance, you look at the principles of 1776 and say, well, 
you know, while that may have been true and good for for that time, you know, speaking of natural rights from our Creator, our reliance on the principles of nature and of nature's God, um, to get to those principles, that that's not true any longer. Because history, as history moves forward, as it progresses, um, we need to move forward with it. And history, as Hegel saw, was actually kind of God working through um, and, you know, propelling us forward. Um, so his, you know, his ideas are very, very prevalent today. You'll, you'll hear this a lot, you know, just about how, well, you know, the living constitution, for instance. I mean, that's mm. definitely heavily, yes. heavily indebted to what Hegel thought of. And then, you know, Nietzsche is a philosopher who is, you know, very, very radical um, and actually supplied, I think, definitely some of the um, philosophical underpinnings to say, you know, some of the rise of fascism, Nazism, etc. But, you know, he has some interesting teachings as well that I think you probably have to take seriously as well. But, you know, de- definitely a very, very radical guy. But it, it was great studying these people um, just because it deepens my own thought, even if I don't agree with them on the surface, to just try to, you know, ascend um, I guess the heights to try to meet these guys at their arguments and everything is is just work in itself. So I think that definitely helps just anybody in, in thinking about these things, even if you disagree with them. Um, you know, you have to meet these guys at their arguments. We don't do that very well as conservatives, meet people at their arguments. Or at least I, I think that's something we should do better. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, that, that's, I, you know, and I was actually just talking to somebody, for instance, you know, you look at Mitt Romney in 2012, and if you just look, you know, hear what he was saying, well, he was basically talking to, you know, it was economics, first of all. I mean, the, the social issues, um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, people like to separate those two things. I mean, those are both basically two sides of the same coin. Um, but, you know, he ran a campaign based on economics. You didn't hear anything about anything social. Um, no, you know, family, abortion, et cetera, not, none of that. Um, but and even in his campaign, though, I mean, it was talk about, you know, the entrepreneurs out there. Well, I mean, the majority of people just don't see themselves that way. They're not going to go out and start a small business. And frankly, just didn't listen to the people in general um, about what their actual concerns were. So, that, yeah, that that's very, very true. I mean, we definitely need to listen to the people. And the people, obviously, you know, they're they're... Very, very important, because that's where all the power is from in government at the end of the day is through the people. The people granted them, you know, some, some use, not, not, not the natural rights that they held, but the exercise of those natural rights for the purposes that their natural rights would be more secure. And, um, you know, unfortunately, government's going, grown way beyond that today. But, um, you know, I'd say just getting back to, you know, Mitt Romney, Republicans, and just conservatives in general, I think it's something we can do a much, much better job at. Speaking of that election... Uh, did Romney lose, or did Obama just really beat the uh, Republicans? You know, I, I would say, um, just looking at it, I would say that Romney did lose. Um, if you look at what he didn't talk about, because um, you'll hear this a lot, saying, well, you know, we need to not talk about those social issues. You know, those kind of made people mad, those independents and so forth. Well, Romney basically ran a campaign that was in line with what, you know, the Carl Rose of the world are saying, and so forth, and he lost. He got the same percentage of the white voters Ronald Reagan did in 1980, uh, but he lost, I think, by about 4 million votes. And actually, a lot of those votes, uh, 4 million votes, lot, were actually a lot of evangelicals that stayed home, that, that just couldn't, con- you know, in their con- in good conscience vote for the guy. Um, so, yeah, and, and if you look at even the difference between 2008 and 2012 for the turnout for the Democrats, it was it was down. It was down. So... I, I think that's something that I think a better candidate who, you know, not only knows the principles, which Romney, I don't think, really showed that he could really intelligently talk about them. I mean, it always seemed like conservatism for him was just kind of a, you know, foreign language, that they were trying to basically make him into something that he wasn't at the end of the day. He was more, you know, say Nelson Rockefeller instead of this, you know, next coming of Reagan, like he was trying to portray himself as. Um so, and I think that's something, you know, in the lessons and everything um, from 2012, I, I really hope Republicans would figure that out because obviously 2016 is, is coming up quickly. And, you know, just everything going on in the world today, you know, foreign, um, just, you know, outside of the country, inside of the country, um, you know, we, we, we definitely need somebody in there who, uh, you know, not only is, is just competent, but who actually knows the principles of the country and is actually... Um, carries out the office of the executive and does the things that a president is supposed to do under the Constitution. So I, I you know, I, I think that that's very, very important. So 
you know, we, we will we will see coming up what happens. It's definitely going to get exciting now. Do you think it's a uh, the Republicans will take back the Senate? Um, I I I think they probably will. Um, I was actually just reading something uh, about you know this executive order that's supposedly coming up where Obama he, he, basically. Um, it's a little more complicated than this, but at the end, will it basically amnesty about five million illegal immigrants? Um, and, you know, they were kind of debating about whether that would happen before the election or after the election. But, you know, if they, they were to happen that before the election, yeah, I, I think the Republicans could definitely take it. And, um, you know, again, it all just comes down to, you know, how these guys run. I know a lot of the polls in a lot of the states where it's, you know, pretty much tied up. Um, a lot of those are looking, you know, at least decently good for Republicans. And, um, you know, we have a lot of good candidates out there, too. Um, Tom Cotton is one of them, I think. Um, he's a representative right now. Um, but, yeah, I, I think the candidates are good, and I, I, I think there's definitely, there's, there's definitely a chance, and especially with what, you know, Obama's been doing or not doing, um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's a good uh, opportunity to take advantage of that and uh, to take back the Senate. So who do you do you see anybody you like on the Republican side for twenty sixteen? Uh, that's you know it's always a tough question. Um, I, again, actually, uh, myself and a couple colleagues were, were talking about that, and I think there's bits and pieces from people I like, but you know I I don't really see anybody in particular that stands out or that has all these things together. Uh, Ted Cruz, I, I really like his principles, um, but you know it's questionable. I think prudentially. Um, you know, how he's going to attain those ends. And uh, some of the things he's done, I think, have been unfortunately kind of counterproductive. Um, you know, some, some of the things that Rand Paul has done is, is, is great um, just in, uh, you know, domestic policy. But, uh, you know, foreign policy, I have, you know, definitely some large questions about what Rand Paul foreign policy would look like. And at the end of the day, if, how much different that would be even than Obama foreign policy. Um, and, you know, Marco Rubio, he's done some great things too, but then you kind of question, okay, well, look at his immigration policy, or at least the immigration policy that he, you know, put forward a couple of years ago and that he said was good, and, you know, about guest worker programs and everything like that. And I guess the problem is, well, you know, if there's a bunch of low-wage, you know, workers that are there, why would you then flood the U.S. market to have more of those and drive wages further down? So that just never made any sense to me. Um, so, like I said, you know, there's pieces and parts that, you know, that I, that I see and that I like from all these guys. I, I just don't see one candidate, at least right now, that's really articulating the principles, but then has the prudence as well. You brought up a, a point I want to go back to, and it's not, you know, we talked about the evangelicals not voting for Romney. Um, right. We would probably might agree that was a failure of the of the of the Republicans to bring forth the candidate. But also, what would you say to the the evangelicals who refuse to vote? You know, I, I would say that, you know, it may be easy just to sit and think, well, you know, I'm just not going to vote. Um, you know, that there is not, not a candidate that I can vote for that, that um, is, is 100% in line, you know, with, with say, what, um, you know, God's teachings are in the Bible um, through, uh, you know, through obviously the, the, the hand of man. But, but at the same time, I would tell them, you know, you can't make perfect the enemy of good. Um, we, we are all fallen people, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, there are governments that are set up, and we have to take part in that, and we can't abdicate that. And I think that's a duty, um, that, that we have to go out into the public square um, and, and profess our faith. And I think, obviously, running for office and achieving office is one of those ways to do it. Um, it's, it, it's a mission. You know, it really is. Just like how we send missionaries out into the third world, I think that that's another thing. And obviously, Washington, D.C., and we need to send a lot of missionaries there, too. You know, it's not just in the third world. I mean, everywhere um, people need to hear the word. So I, I would say that, you know, and it's easy just to think, well, I'm just one person. But, you know, in aggregate, like I said, if, you know, four million people in the evangelical stayed home. And that, that, that is a problem. And if they would have actually come together, we may be in a, in a better place right now. That's, that is, I think that is very true. I think that uh, it, I think both, both sides are wrong. Republicans are wrong for not listening to the evangelicals, and I think the evangelicals are wrong in not exercising their God-given duty here 
right. this is such a privilege to right. take part to take part in, in, in the government by voting. I mean, there's a lot of people in the world who don't even begin to have this right. Um, and so um, it's that thought that, you know, I'm just going to fold my arms and stay home and not vote. Well, uh, not even, you know, and, and it's even worse than that. Half or half the population of the adult population who could vote are not even registered to vote in this country. Yes, I, I think that's about right. I think in general, I think Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, I think combined, probably got about, I would say, somewhere in between 110 million to 120 million. Well, guess what? The population of this country is 30 million. I would say, you know, the percentage that can actually vote are, you know, somewhere well above 200 million. So you're right. I mean, that, that unfortunately, you know, it's like we're living in such a great country and we have such a great opportunity. Um, you, you just have to take advantage of it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's not inevitable that the United States is just going to be always the way it is. It's, it's up to the people at the end of the day, and it's up to their character and their virtue. And, um, you know, whether or not they take God's word seriously or not or follow him or not, and, and that that's very, very important. It's a privilege, like you said. So I think we should all take it seriously. We've been talking for quite a few minutes now. Is there anything that you wanted to bring up in this interview that I have not thought to ask? Um, actually, I, I just kind of wanted to mention, you know, to, to your listeners and to everybody just real fast, just, you know, kind of following, uh, you know, the, the governor's race, obviously, in Ohio, um, you know, which I've, I've been still trying to keep up with. Um, and that, that seems to be you know, pretty much over already. I, I see uh, campaign aides and et cetera, um, you know, going away from Fitzgerald's campaign. Um, but also, too, just even about um, kind of the, the common core legislation to repeal it. Um, State of Ohio, I know Representative Thompson and Representative Puffman um, have joined and are uh, putting that legislation through. Um, you know, there's obviously some roadblocks. Unfortunately, there are some Republicans on the other side who see common core as a good thing and, and want to stop that. But I, I think that their efforts, you know, need to be a Audit and that you know people should definitely call in at the state house and, and urge their representatives and senators um, to uh, be in favor of this repeal legislation. More and more states are doing it, and um, especially what's just going on in education right now, um, we need to do this now before it gets entrenched. We obviously see through the administrative state, through these departments and everything, it's really hard to change things once something is in place. Much easier to do it in the beginning. So I would say that 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 you know that's definitely very important to uh, try to repeal Common Core and uh, you know set standards that are actually good, um, that are actually in line with America's principles, and um, which not only you know provide people with careers, but it's even more than that. It, it, it's that they provide people with actually good lives and lives that are filled with happiness. That's what we want for all of us. Thank you yep. again, my friend, for this interview. This time again, we spent. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, seeing interviewing you again next year to see how, how you're progressing. And so, my listeners, this is uh, Reverend Thomas Wise. I've been, the show is called Politically Wise. I've been interviewing Mike Sabo, a young man that God has definitely put on a mission. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. We ever forget that we're one nation under God, and we will be a nation gone under. Join us in publicly display this model. In God, God We Trust. Go to InGodWeTrust.com today. Order your decal and display it proudly. Let's again write In God We Trust on our buildings, in our classrooms, to combat the anti-God dismantling of our nation. Say it and display it. In God We Trust. Go to InGodWeTrust.com. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here is your blessing. Blessings based on Psalms chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord saves? Do you know the Lord answers? Do you know the Lord's power? Do you trust in the name of the Lord God? It is God who allows you to rise up and stand firm. It is God who answers you when you call. 
It is God who is your blessing.